This will just be a quick video. It's not a deep study. Uh, I'm just responding to a subscriber's question. So um, I had a question from, I'll just call him John. And I do apologize. Uh, I hope you don't mind being publicly mentioned here, John. It's just because obviously it's a public comment, not an email. So I hope you don't mind. So he's asking whether free grace teaching is for itching ears, right? And this comes from 2 Timothy 4. And obviously you will have heard the uh, work salvation type guys say this kind of thing that we're just teaching to itching ears essentially when we preach that salvation is by grace but there's a couple of other things going on as well so he's saying that perhaps it's it's making him not fear god all the time or it's making him less conscious or or about sin or less careful so we need to perhaps address that a little bit as well so i did this as a public response job because i thought uh, other people would probably benefit from the answer to this same question okay so when you look at 2 Timothy 4 and you look at where this comes from, uh, he's telling them that there will be people who won't endure sound doctrine, okay, or correct teaching, if you will, in, in layman's terms, but they'll instead turn to various fables. And, and you can think of fables like, for example, midwife's tales or superstitious things, or just basically people turn to things that aren't really true, but they believe that like it's true, okay. Now, what you'll notice in this chapter here is that we're not really having any dialogue from Paul about grace versus works, okay? So when people say that, well, if, if you believe in grace or you believe in faith without works, you're just teaching to itching ears. Well, the problem with this is that it's really a matter of perspective, okay? Because they're arguing from the presupposition that their work salvation and their conditional securities is sound doctrine. Okay, so that's why they will accuse us of itching ears. But the thing is, we can flip that around and say, well, no, you're the ones preaching to itching ears. Okay, because if you have a works based salvation, if you think that you're going to get to heaven because you're such a righteous, repentant Christian, well, of course, those itching ears are going to want to hear somebody tell them, hey, keep working, guys, you're going to make it. Okay, so this is really. To just call it itching ears because we teach grace, it's really a matter of perspective because we could say that about everybody that we oppose, right? And if you just think, you know, pound for pound, how popular people are, you know, there are plenty of holiness preachers like Francis Chan, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, etc., etc., who they get hundreds of thousands of, of subscribers and Christian listeners, okay? Most of us that teach grace without any extra buts and extra conditions in there, and without double talk, we don't really have a lot of subscribers, okay? We are considered to be a marginal fringe of Christianity, okay? So it's not like we're amassing this great audience like I'm a Joel Osteen or something. So you can see there that really, I mean, grace versus works is not really the talking point here, okay? So you really have to assume that your position is already true to even argue from this passage. But it's basically, it's about people who don't want to endure sound doctrine, okay, or correct teaching. So the next thing then, John, is that you're sort of asking whether it makes you not fear God or that it's making you less conscious of sin. Well, again, there's some degree of a matter of perspective here, okay? Because in terms of fearing God, I mean, yes, obviously God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind, but the same God who said that is the same God who also tells us to fear the Lord, right? Okay, so there is a certain healthy aspect of fearing God there, right? But the thing is, if you compare, say, those of us who believe in grace to uh, what we tend to call holy preachers, although we're often doing it, do it mockingly. So let's say we pick somebody who says you must turn from all of your sins to be saved. Uh, you must uh, do this or you'll lose your salvation. And you think of people like, for example, Jesse Morell or Keith Wheeler at White City Preachers, right? Well, I've exposed those two men before on my channel because regarding eternal life, Jesus said, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day, right? Well, they've both answered that passage by running off to a different passage in another chapter of John, where it says that none of them is lost but the son of perdition, referring to Judas Iscariot. Now, that verse did not say that Jesus lost Judas, okay? It just said that Judas was lost. But then they use that verse, when it's not even talking about eternal life, to cancel out a verse where Jesus said, I should lose nothing, right? Well, that's an example of not fearing God because Jesus said, I should lose nothing. Okay, I will in no wise cast out. Some liar comes along and says, oh no, actually he will lose you because he lost Judas. Okay, that's blasphemous. That's not fear of the Lord. So I hope you understand that again, this is really a matter of perspective because the people that will say this against us 
we can just as easily spin it on them, okay? And if the Bible says we're saved by grace, and someone says, no, it must include the works, well, again, that's not very fearful if God's saying this, and they're coming out and saying this, okay? Or if the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, and they come out saying, surrender your life to Christ, and you shall be saved. And I type in my Bible, I can't even find the word surrender, okay? That is not a fear of God. When you have to change the words of the Bible, because the Bible said not to add and remove from his word, right? I don't have to change the Bible to preach the gospel that I preach. The words of the Bible are perfectly sufficient for me. So again, this fearing the Lord is a, is a matter of perspective. Because if God says this and they come out saying, no, it's this, and they attribute that to God telling them, well, that's not fearing God, okay? But then regarding the, the consciousness of, of sin, and this may depend on sort of terminology when we use words like conscious. But the first passage that came to my mind was Hebrews chapter 10. And this is where it talks about the Old Testament sacrifices that were going on and on and on and on. But um, the, they, they didn't stop being offered because the worshippers, if, if these sacrifices were actually effective, then once the worshippers were purged, they should have no more conscience of sin, right? But the sacrifices made a remembrance to that sin every single year because every time you sinned you had to go and offer another sacrifice right whereas jesus is the one final sacrifice so even when we struggle with sin after we're saved it doesn't change the fact that jesus is the one final sacrifice he doesn't need to get up on that cross all over again and deal with it all over again okay so you know he's explained that we shouldn't have the conscience of sin now that's maybe not quite talking about the same thing that you're talking about but then he goes on to say later in the chapter, let us have a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So the solution there is that that full assurance of faith, right? The profession of our faith. And really a lot of the book of Hebrews, a lot of it is dealt with continuing in the faith and not losing the hope that you once had or not, um, not having a hard heartedness or an evil heart of unbelief. Okay, so. That, that full assurance of faith does sprinkle our conscience because Jesus has already dealt with our sins, okay? But the thing is, like you say, you are not out in the world actively seeking to live in sin, but it's certainly not holy. Well, again, holiness according to who? Because the people who preach holiness are not themselves holy, okay? Now, a, a passage that they'll often quote, which actually also often comes from uh, Hebrews 12, um, it says that without holiness, uh, no man shall see the Lord somewhere. I'm forgetting what um, what verse it is here. Yeah, uh, but the thing, uh, so without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That comes from verse 14. And so this, well, see, you have to be holy. But the thing is, this passage has already explained that God deals with us as sons and chasten us. As, and, you know, it's not always pleasant when God does that, but it's so that we can partake in his holiness. OK, so it's, it get that it's it's what God's doing for us that helps us partake in his holiness. It's not something that we're doing that's leading to this holiness, okay? And please don't misunderstand me, you know, turning from sin is a good thing, okay? You know, despite the fact that I'm constantly attacking it, I only attack it insofar as making a gospel message and a requirement to be saved. But the thing is, you know, sin can still do damage to your life, okay? You know, if you keep indulging in the flesh, then, you know, when you actually do want to go and enjoy things which are lawful you'll just find that you probably won't enjoy them anymore you know like if you keep watching the pornography you're not going to be satisfied with your wife or you know if you keep hitting the drink you're not going to learn how to deal with your problems in a spiritually guided manner that comes from the father okay you, you know you're constantly resorting to the wrong thing to fix your problems and i know they're just two examples um but you know that it's it's really the fact that it's destructive in of itself ought to be a good enough reason for us to turn from those sins and you know unlike the world we actually have a heavenly father to turn to they don't have that you know which is why they need the pleasures and the drink and the party and all these stuff to, to put them out of their misery okay so um the last thing then is uh, why do you think free grace theology could make others feel easy well you know the bible explains uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff going on here but the bible explains that these things are um, spiritually discerned uh, the bible does explain that sometimes God hardens people's hearts because they don't believe or people that are just there are just people that they see and they don't see or you know hearing they hear not as Jesus explained and the thing is like pe people have come against grace well well you're giving people a license to sin even though we've never advocated sin and I've even just told you in this video to turn from sin and even when you point this out to them 
they still accuse you of a license to sin because they've got this sin conscience. They haven't been sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb. Okay, they haven't ridden their sin conscience. And that's why they've got such a weird obsession about sin for some reason. And so really it's uneasy because grace, the free unmerited gift of God is foolishness. Okay, the message of the cross is foolishness to people that perish. Okay, but you know, to the best Will, will in the world, you know, people out there, you know, like myself and others that are out there, we, we do these videos that we do to try and help people who are stumbling with this because there are people who will, seeing this stuff, then realise and they will come to the truth, even though most Christians won't. And so um, I hope that these kind of uh, answer all of your uh, questions. God bless.